So, Colossians, uh, we're in this uh, great little letter, which I love, and I thought tonight it'd be good um, to explore a little bit about the context of Colossians and why it was written. Um, Now, much ink has been spilt on the question of the Colossian heresy. Um, So I'll give you some options. Uh, What was this Colossian heresy? Uh, So some writers, like N.T. Wright, say it was some form of Judaism. Um, Other people, or lots of commentators, say it was some form of pseudo-Gnosticism, whatever that means, and whether that actually did exist at the time is another debate. Um, And then Dick Lucas, I like Dick Lucas, he just comes and says, it's providentially vague. I'm going to go with Dick Lucas. I think it's providentially vague. Um, But there is this kind of heresy. The church is under attack. Now, we're only going to really look at verses 15 to to 23. Um, But I want us to read from verse 24 to chapter 2, verse 5, to see the kind of intensity of what Paul is writing. He really is keen that they're established and guarded in the faith. And he is concerned that there are these kind of fine-sounding arguments that are coming along, and they might kind of rugby tackle them and take them out of the way. And so what he wants to do is, as you can see at the end there in chapter 1, verse 28, he wants to proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we can be presented mature, perfect in the faith. I think it's fair to say that there's always been in the church pressures from both outside the church and inside the church which want to take people away from the gospel Um, when you kind of read the history of the church particularly the first few hundred years um, one of the things they constantly seem to be having is these councils and they keep writing these creeds and the reason is is because in the early days of christianity everybody was just running off believing different things and people wanted to come in and they wanted to change what they believed Because if you just change slight things at the core of the Christian gospel, it changes everything morally. Now, if you were here this morning, one of the links I tried to draw this morning was the link between what we believe and how we behave. So often we change what we believe because we want to behave in a different way. So if you want to live in a certain way, then you've really, first of all, you've got to change what you believe about the authority of Scripture. And then if you can change what you believe about the authority of Scripture, then you can change what you believe about the character of God. Because it's no longer what does the Bible say about God, but it's, well, what do I think God is like? And thankfully, whenever anybody does that, it's clearly in their own image. So it just works out very well for them. And so we've got to be very careful with our beliefs. And so they want to guard these um, beliefs. Now, let me show you a couple of the errors that were coming in. Have a look down to chapter 2, and um, let's have a look at a few of these kind of aspects of the Colossian heresy. Um, So chapter 2 and verse 16 and 17, we see legalism. There was an aspect of legalism. Verse 16, therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or even a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So you can see where there was perhaps this idea that it was the Jewish kind of flavour to this heresy. Um, So one aspect of this Colossian heresy was legalism. There are certain things you must do, rules you must obey. But don't think of just kind of straight-laced legalism. There's also an element of mysticism. So verses 18 and 19 Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. I've always been fascinated by that verse. Um, False humility is great, isn't it? I mean, I am, you know, I I mean, you don't need to tell me. I know I am the most humble person in the room, but thank you for telling me. Um, But no, I'm only joking, but you can tell me later on if you want. Um, I mean, false humility and then worship of angels. There's a debate. Um, Is it that they're worshipping angels or are they obsessed about the way angels worship? Um, I don't know, but whatever it is, it's very mystical. Um, And so it goes on, so don't let anyone who delights in these things, he says, such a person also goes into great detail about what they've seen. They're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They've lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by uh, ligaments and sinews, grows and as God causes it to grow. 
So one of the other things you see in, in the history of the church is not just people trying to change the doctrine, and so they have to have these kind of councils and creeds to make sure that we stick to the Bible. What you also get as well is with every generation, um, you get different breakaway groups. And they go off and they kind of break away from the main branch of the church. And then they've had these experiences. They've had these revelations. They've seen these things. They know. And next thing, they're judging you by what you don't know, by what you haven't experienced. And it's always very mystical. Um, but as well, I mean, this is quite a wide heresy, isn't it? This is why I think it's providentially vague. Um, because then it goes on in verses 20 to 23 to describe a kind of ascetic way of life. Um, so verse 20, uh, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom and their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgences. Um, it's interesting at the moment, um, Rebecca and I have been fighting over a book this weekend. Um, she's been ill in bed and we've, we've both started reading the same book at the same time, which is never good when it's a, it's a good book. It's a fascinating book. It's unpicking, some of you will understand this perhaps more than others, the kind of purity culture um, kind of move that happened in the 90s. Some of you will remember it. Um, books like I Kiss Dating Goodbye. Um, and, and basically, it's just a train wreck. Um, I mean, the people that wrote the book aren't even Christians anymore. They've all left their wives. I mean, what did they do? They came up with a whole list of rules about women were allowed to wear or not allowed to wear, what people were allowed to do or not to do. None of it in the Bible. They just imposed it on poor young people. And what's happened? They've just all flown off. Why? Because it had the kind of, it looked wise in a worldly way, but actually wasn't spiritual at all. A kind of forced asceticism where we don't have enough rules in the Bible. And the problem with the generation that's come up now is they've realized that these rules aren't in the Bible, and then they've gone, so everything I was taught was a lie. Because we put culture and kind of Christianity together. And so Paul is saying in Colossians, be very careful of legalism, mysticism, asceticism. So what's the answer? Well, I think Paul's answer is quite simple. It's just applying it that is the art. The answer is quite simple. Make sure you realise that Jesus is enough. That's the answer. You see, legalism, mysticism and asceticism are all based on the belief that Jesus isn't enough. Jesus hasn't lived enough. So you need legalism. You've got to obey all of the rules because you forget that they were just a shadow preparing us for Jesus. Mysticism. You've got to have these additional experiences because Jesus isn't enough. Asceticism. You've got to be harsh on yourself because Jesus isn't enough. So the big argument of Colossians is this whole idea of being complete. So we're going to see tonight that we have a complete Christ in his person and then next week, we're going to see how we have a complete cross, how the cross completely pays for all of our sins. Uh, we need to look at Jesus. So let's have a look at this, and we're going to try and work out then how the person of Christ and what he's done helps us combat this Colossian heresy, whatever it looks like um, in our own lives. So let, let's have a look at Jesus, um, see what he's like. Um, I wonder what you thought Jesus was like before you became a Christian. So, uh, can you remember back that far when you weren't a Christian, what your view of Jesus was? Perhaps maybe think of family and friends at the moment um, who aren't Christians. Um, what do you think Jesus is like? I think for lots of people, um, particularly uh, young children, um, they think of little baby Jesus um, because they're, they're so used to the Christmas story. Um, and I remember doing an assembly once, and I went and I talked to the children afterwards, and I'd done an assembly, and it genuinely happened, because I always thought these kind of things were urban myths, where one of the little girls in the school was amazed by how much Jesus had done in the three months of his life, between Christmas and Easter. Um, she just couldn't get her head around that he'd lived for like 30 years. Um, but lots of people have this idea of Jesus as a cute, cuddly, helpless, weak baby. Or maybe some people get to the the kind of grown-up Jesus, but really what they've got in mind then is this kind of 
wet man with long blonde hair and a kink at the end who wears sandals and never really says anything harsh. It's an interesting kind of concept that people have of, of Jesus. So what was he like? Because in the end, Jesus changed everything, didn't he? I mean, we, this morning we talked about an earthquake moment, a seismic shift. Think of the shifts that happened um, on that uh, life. So our dating system changed. We've changed how we date. Every time we say a year, 2023, it's 2023 years since the birth of our Lord, or roughly, the month where it's slightly wrong. But I mean, it just changed our dating system. Our biggest holidays of the year are still around Christmas and Easter. The most popular jewellery is still a cross. And every year, he transforms millions of lives. So what is it about Jesus that can change everything? Well, let's look at uh, two things from the passage. The first thing is to realise is that Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully God. That's what we see in verses 15 uh, to 19. The Son is the image of the invisible God. If I can say this uh, sentence respectfully, the problem with God is (laughs) he's invisible. That is utterly frustrating. How many people say, I wish God would make himself more clear. Only God revealed himself. That's the problem with God. He is invisible. And the problem with an invisible God is, how do you get to know them? Think about an invisible friend. Did anybody have invisible friends growing up? But, but think about an actual invisible friend, someone who is invisible. How would you ever get to know someone who's invisible? You wouldn't even know they're there. And, and lots of people, I think, live as so though God were invisible And so, like us trying to work out the invisible man, we've got to work out God. So travel, yoga, drugs, philosophy, reading, academia, whatever it is, we pursue all of these things, hoping to work out the invisible God. This is why I love verse 15 so much. The sun is the image of the invisible God. Um, As Rico Tice put it in the Christianity Explored course, the guessing games about God is over. The guessing games about God is over. Because he is the image of the invisible God. Um, A couple of weeks ago, I was down in St. David's Cathedral. um, And as I was going to St. David's Cathedral, I had a a vivid memory of, as a a child, going into St. David's Cathedral. And you know in the... um, what do they call the central bit? I'm going to have to look at people with Anglican backgrounds. Is it the nave or... Well, you know where all the choir stalls are? Um, is that the nave? I don't know. The chancel. Oh, that sounds... I'm going to take that. There we are. The chancel. And it's got this lovely ceiling in St. David's. But you crick your neck, don't you? So does anybody know how you see the ceiling in St. David's? They've got a mirror on a table, haven't they? So they've put a mirror on the table. And so what you do is you look at the mirror on the table... And you can see the ceiling perfectly. It's the image of, in a sense, the invisible. And what we have in Jesus is a complete mirror of God. By looking at Jesus on earth, you understand God in heaven. The guessing games about God are completely gone. Jesus would say to people, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. What we have in Jesus is God, in effect, shrunk to the size of a man. Really, the invisible man has decided to reveal himself, to become visible. And so he says, look, he really is God. He is the firstborn over all creation. And then you think, well, hold on, what does that mean? Firstborn, does that mean he was born? Is he not God? These are the kind of debates that we have um, with the kind of Narnians and the sea, why lots of them have questions about this. Well, what's going on? Is he born? Well, no, firstborn is about status. doesn't happen so much anymore. Does it? any of you middle child syndrome going on here? You weren't the firstborn. Um, it doesn't happen anymore. Um, we were down in um, uh, um, Tradiga House, you know, the, the big national trust place in, in Newport. And when you go through the kind of the history of these buildings... One of the reasons they've had to go to places like National Trust is because it kept going to the firstborn, didn't it? Which always had to be a male. And if it didn't, then it had to be split up in different ways. And it was just, you know, that whole firstborn thing is is really important. Not so much today, but in history. So when it says here that he is the firstborn, what it means is he is the one who has everything, as God has everything. 
It's the firstborn over all creation. Verse 16, for in him all things were created. So Jesus was the one who created. Think of the different words for Jesus in the New Testament. One of my favorite ones is in John's Gospel. The first title for Jesus in John's Gospel is the Word. And how did God the Father create the world? Through his Word. He spoke and the Word created. The Spirit was there hovering. God in Trinity creating everything. And so he's the one who has created all things, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things are being created through him and for him. This is a huge defense of the divinity of Christ. Paul is coming at this in every angle to make sure we understand he is God. He is God. He is God. He is completely God. It's amazing to have a God who reveals himself. I remember a great um, episode of a funny comedy series. I don't know if I'm allowed to mention the comedy series here. I won't say what it is, but if you know what it is, you'll remember. And uh, one of the sketches in there was the World Championships of Hide and Seek. I don't know if anybody remembers that programme. And there's a couple of great sketches where these people are just jumping on planes, flying halfway across the world and hiding in caves. I mean, it's just a preposterous idea, isn't it? The World Championships of Hide and Seek. The World Championships of Hide and Seek would be an impossible game. But actually to find God would be even more impossible if he decided not to reveal himself. He's not just hiding in the world, he's hiding in the galaxy. But actually God doesn't want to hide. In fact, think about it, he created the entire galaxy. One of those reasons for that must be because he wants to reveal himself. So that every time we go out in the evening and we see the stars, we wonder... How am I able to think and comprehend this? How is this world able to sustain my life when the universe is so huge? For everything that has to come for what they call the Goldilocks enigma. That's what they call our world, isn't it? The Goldilocks enigma. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. How did that happen? We're meant to look. Or then the scientists who get under the kind of microscope and look into our bodies and DNA and all of this. You look at how complex everything is. Even a simple cell is a contradiction in terms. There are no simple things at all. And God has um, created it all and he wants us to see him. And so Jesus comes and here he is. He is fully God. For us to understand and get away from legalism, um, asceticism and mysticism, the first step is to understand that Jesus is fully God. It's a huge part of who he is. And when you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, repeatedly, Jesus is proving his divinity. Um, Repeatedly, he's doing these miracles. And whilst he's doing miracles for the good of people, he's also doing it to represent who he is. When you listen to what he says, most of the time in what he's saying, he's reflecting something in the Old Testament, which is the divinity of God. Even a simple statement like, I am, to our English ears, sounds like, well, yeah, I am. Until you realise that I am is the same phrase as God uses to reveal himself. Remember in the book of Exodus, when he goes out and he's in the burning bush, and Moses says, who's sending me? Who shall I say? What's your name? I am. I am. And so here's, he uses this I am, and then he has this kind of repeated phrase, and I am the good shepherd. Well, hold on, that's going back to the shepherd of the Old Testament. He's continually proving who he is. So how do we know, then, that he is God? I mean, uh, let's go back to the the CY and the Narnians and to our friends, perhaps, who aren't Christians yet. Um, It's one thing for someone to say they're God, but are they really God? So what would you do? So if the invisible man was here tonight, the invisible God, and then he became visible... Would you believe he was God? So let's go through it, okay? What does he have to do to prove to you that he is God? So the first thing you could do is ask. Say, are you God? (laughs) Yes. You convinced? I think I could take you into town and find a few people that we could ask, and they might be convinced they're God. And a little bit more after ten tonight. 
I mean, just because he claims something doesn't mean he is. Okay, well, what happens then if we test him? What happens if we say, turn my water into wine? Only a glass, I won't have a pint of wine. That would be wrong. But turn my water into wine. Well, what happens if he did that? Would you then go automatically, oh, you must be God, because you've turned water into wine? No, we all be going, what's up his sleeve? It's just another David Blaine. I mean, what's going on? Okay, then, let's go for a bigger test. How about... Um, who should I get? Get Mr. Askew, because you look like you could. Get Mr. Askew to kill him. <laughs> Sorry, it's the beard. Kill him, and then get him to come back to life. So what happens if we get, he gets killed, and then he comes back to life? Would you believe then? Some of you, no. Because you go in, he's in on it. I never trusted that beard. He's in on it. He knows what, maybe he didn't know what he was doing. After all, he's a minister, he doesn't know how to kill anybody. I mean, we should have got someone else to do it. We should have got, you, you know how to do it. You're a doctor. You could do it and get away with it. I mean, come on. That's what we should, you, is it enough? I mean, what does someone have to do to prove they're God? How about this thing? Because I think we've got the skills in the room to do this. How about we do get one of our medical professionals to break the Hippocratic Oath and to kill them properly under proper medical examination controls? Then once they're killed, get someone else who also has those qualifications to do a test to make sure they're dead. And then, um, are the kids back in school tomorrow? It'll be fine. We'll lock them in the cupboard there. Okay? We'll come back in a few days. And then we'll see if he can come back to life. Well, then you've got more trans believing him, haven't you? Everything's now stacked against him. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus comes. He says he's God. He does all the miracles to show he's God. But ultimately, he's killed publicly by professionals. They come and they test that he's dead by putting a spear through his heart. And then they lock him in a tomb behind a massive stone. The idea that he got away with that, that he'd only swooned, he'd only fallen asleep. And then having done that, he woke up, and on the hands that he'd had pierced, standing on the feet that had been pierced, with his back that had been whipped and torn to shreds, he then pushed the stone out of the way and carried around doing a heavy teaching ministry for the next 40 days in front of hundreds of people crazy unless of course he really was God and he really did beat death and he really did come to life <clears throat> Jesus prove it and he wants to make sure Paul wants us to make sure that we understand that this is our Jesus he is God and he is above everything and that means verse 18 he is the head of the body the church why because he is the one who died for us we are his church, and he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. It's wonderful, isn't it? I love the way that he is the firstborn from among the dead. He's not the only born. He is the firstborn. Many others are coming. That's you and me. He is the first. And what does it say? So that in everything he might have the supremacy. Why? Verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him jesus is fully god do you know when you look at the creation it is amazing the smallest molecule or dna that was created by jesus life itself and our ability to have life created by jesus community love emotions created by jesus the mountains and the sea and nature created by Jesus, the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, created by Jesus. Um, I often say, if you want to know how good a builder is, don't just ask for recommendations. Go and have a look at what they've done. <laughs> That's what you want to do. Go and have a look. Because when you go, you will know how good the builder is. If you want to know how amazing Jesus is, just look at the world. It shows how amazing he is. He has done um, everything. But not only is he God, secondly and, and finally, Jesus is the saviour of the world. Uh, verse 20 to 23, it says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood 
shed on the cross. You see, why did Jesus come to earth? Why did the invisible God make himself visible? Why did God give up uh, his kind of glorious position in heaven, become one of us, be kind of confined to a kind of human body, face all of the difficulties that he faced? Why did he do it? Well, it's because we needed to be reconciled. We needed to have peace made for us. We needed to be saved. You see, when you look at God's amazing creation, it's actually a mess, isn't it? So even in the DNA of life, things can go wrong. Even down to our genes, things can go wrong. And even creation itself is filled with tsunamis and earthquakes. Or even society and community can use all of their goodness in such a way to take advantage of the poor. Just think about all the good things that God has done. Actually, we have misused them. So whilst Jesus has this amazing power and potential, his power and potential in the world has been misused and ruined. How's that? Well, it's by the tenants. It's by you and me, isn't it? So let's imagine the builder again. We've moved away from the imaginary invisible man. We're now with the builder. Imagine a great builder. Everybody says the builder's great. And they say, you should see the houses he builds. They are the best houses that you can buy. And then you could decide to go and see one of his houses. It's one he built two years ago. And when you go to his house, even as you pull up, you think, I don't think I'd want to live here. And, And as you get closer to the house, you can see a little bit of a trickle of water running outside where clearly the overflow is going on the path. And, you know, that just hasn't been stopped. And then when you go in, the door doesn't close quite right. And it feels a bit cold and and damp. And then you look at the walls, and they're a mess. I mean, there's just scrapes everywhere, and there's holes in different places. I mean, the house is a mess. Now, you've got a choice at that point. You can either go, what a rubbish builder. Or ask the question, who's been living here? You see, when you look at the world today, lots of people go, what a rubbish God. But it's not a rubbish God. It's the tenants. It's what we've done. We've taken God's amazing planet, his perfectly tuned planet. Think about that Goldilocks um, enigma again. Everything in the world finally perfectly tuned. And what have we done? We've taken it and gone our own way. I've lived in a number of houses. Let me tell you some of the things I did to houses. And then you'll be glad you never let me rent from you. In one house, poor lady had gone to the mission field in Cambodia, left us in her house. I think she'd come back because um, me and my my flatmate, we we loved two things. Number one, we loved uh, coffee from fresh ground. Uh, We loved coffee. And the other thing we loved eating was rice. Um, But one thing we didn't like doing was cleaning things out properly. And so these kind of coffee grounds and these kind of leftover rice would go down the sink like every day and then after about eight or nine months the sink would take longer and longer to kind of drain away and uh, she has forgiven me so I can share the story now and, and to my shame we just kept going just trying to get that water down until one day there was just this huge bang and then all of this dirty water started coming under the floor we'd burst the pipes under it and it was a horrendous mess and you're glad they never lived in your house now. How? Just a little bit, day in, day out, day in, day out, cutting corners, being selfish, not doing things the way they should be done, and it builds up. I could tell you lots of other stories. I'll just leave it there, I think. Otherwise, um, I'll have nothing left for another sermon. But, but, but that's what we've done to the world. Now, how would you feel if you'd built that amazing house, think about it, and two years later it'd been trashed? Or you'd let me come and stay in your house because you've gone to Cambodia and I trashed your kitchen. I mean, be honest. You wouldn't be happy, would you? Not only would you not be happy, you'd be eyeing up the cost. There's two problems then, isn't there? Our relationship and the cost of fixing what's been messed. Well, what Paul is saying here is that God had all of his fullness dwell in Jesus. Why? To reconcile to himself all things. Now, I find this fascinating because what it's showing us here is that gospel of reconciliation has both a kind of 
personal aspect and a physical world aspect. And I think it's always important to, to, to understand that. So there's a sense in which when Jesus died on the cross, he died for the physical world. Not that the physical world can repent and trust in Christ, but actually God wants the world to be made new. One of the great messages of the Christian gospel is, is that one day this world is going to be burnt up. That's a purifying fire. And we're going to live on this earth for eternity, but there'll be no more sin or suffering or mess in this world. They'll be completely saved. But more in the heart of that is changing us, is reconciling us. It's amazing, isn't it? The builder doesn't come in and say, there we are then, I forgive you, but I'm going to demolish the house. He doesn't say that at all. He comes in and says, I'm going to pay. I'm going to restore this house. And I'm going to restore our relationship. And that's a huge cost. Um, John Stott calls this in the cross of Christ, the self-substitution of God. What God does in Christ is, he gives himself so that he pays for it. Um, I've been reading a book lately. Um, It's um, Forgive by Tim Keller. I haven't finished it yet, but it's fast becoming probably my favourite book of the year. Um, Forgive by Tim Keller. And and he kind of opens this up a little bit, and it's worth um, listening to what um, Tim Keller says on on this theme. I found it so helpful. Because often, uh, one of the questions people ask is, well, look, if God's the builder and we rebel, why can't God just forgive us? Has anybody ever seen those posters on churches? God forgives, that's his job. Have you ever seen that poster? It's really not helpful. Because where did we ever think that it's God's job to forgive? God is holy. It's not his job to forgive. It's not our right to be forgiven. Actually, Jesus has to come and die for us. Because God can't just forgive. Why? Because of his law, of him in his character, in in who he is. And so what he does is he sends his only son. Jesus comes, the Father sends him, the Son comes willingly. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in eternity had planned this together. And Jesus comes and lives, fulfills the law in every way. So that then when he dies, he pays the price of all of our rebellion. He does it all, which is amazing. And then it says this. Um, he, um, uh, uh, Tim Keller, sorry, um, says this. The cross does not merely provide a temporary respite from condemnation. We're told that Christ stands before the Father as our legal representative, our advocate. What this means is that the law, once our enemy, which demanded our punishment, now becomes our friend, demanding our acceptance. I found this quite thought-provoking and heartwarming. So we always think of the law, and we're going to see this next week. We're going to think about the written code, the written law, which stood kind of ahead of us and stood over us. We often think of the law as this thing that comes down to us, and then Jesus pays the law, and therefore the law now has no place. But actually, Keller points out, no, 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 it's more than that. Jesus comes, and he pays off the law. He lives our life, he dies our death, he rises from the dead. And then he promises that one day he's going to restore the house. But then he does this amazing thing. Because Jesus has fulfilled the law and he has paid the price, that law which once stood against us now stands for us. This is amazing. Now it stands for us. So when, as we sing, Satan comes and tempts me to despair, upward I look and see him there. And the law says... Well, he can't be condemned because Jesus has paid for it. He can't be cast off because Jesus has loved him and lived it. And so what Jesus is constantly doing is showing what he's done to reconcile us. I mean, it's an amazing thing um, that he's done for us in the gospel. When you consider who we were, look at verse 21. Once you were alienated from God, you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But... Now in Christ, he has reconciled you through Christ's physical body, through death, to present you wholly in his sight. And look at how he saved us, without blemish and free from accusation. We've got to remember that this is everything. We don't need to have a legalistic mindset. 
We don't need to have a mystical mindset. We don't need to have an ascetic mindset. It's all been done by the Lord Jesus Christ. But then everybody freaks out with verse 23, don't they? If you continue in your faith, establish and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. As we come to a close, what do we make of those verses? Well, I think, number one, you never want to take the sting out of that warning. That passage is there for a reason. And the reason is this. If you're not holding on to the hope that is yours, where is your hope? Where is your hope? He's not saying if you obey the laws, if you have this mystical experience, if you are able to say to yourself, don't do that, and you live that holiness. He's not saying that. That's not the judgment of it. The judgment is, if you continue in your faith, established and firm. It's interesting language, isn't it? Established and firm. Um, It's language that he kind of comes back and forth to um, in this letter. Really, being established and firm is being in Christ. So here's the question. At which point... Are you not hoping in Christ that shows you don't have hope in Christ? It's a big question because perhaps we have friends or loved ones, the people we were praying for earlier on, who have wandered away. And at one point they publicly declared they were Christians and now don't seem to be anywhere. Where are they? Well, I think it's fair to say none of us knows apart from God the Father. All we can say is that the law, the law's demands have been met in Jesus. And so if someone has trusted in Christ, the law demands that they're saved. So if someone has trusted in Christ and has been saved, and Christ has died for them and their sins have been taken away, the law now demands that they're saved. So those who are saved are saved. But... When you read the New Testament, you see that there are these warnings that actually it's possible to be in the church, but not to be a Christian. To have been someone who's come and tasted of the gospel, tasted of the spirit, experienced something of it, seemingly trusted in Christ, but then not. Now this really freaks out the early church. And you get letters like 1 John written about it. And one of the things that they'll often come back and say is this. Well, look, if they were one of us, they would never have gone out from us. By going out from us, they show that they're not one of us. So what does that work out to us? Let me give you, I think, what it could mean for different people. So it does mean that someone can come and have what we call a a false conversion experience where someone might genuinely think they've become a Christian but they haven't they haven't truly been born again Um, they could have trusted in a false gospel Um, we don't know why but they just weren't truly born again there was no regenerate work in their heart their status in heaven did not change because if their status had changed that would be irrevocable the law now stands on their side And so some people, by their fruit, have shown that they were never saved. Now, I think we've got to be very careful in ever deciding that's the case with anyone. (coughs) I never want to decide that's the case with anybody. It's not my place to make that judgment. Um, I think that's a dangerous thing to start deciding where people are eternally. But I think that is possible. I think the second possibility is that they are a Christian who is truly born again. And as we sung at the start, they need their hearts retuned. They've grown cold. They've what we call backslidden. They've found themselves bowing the knee to other idols. Now they are truly converted. They're truly converted. 
but they live in a fallen world and the pressures and the false messages out there are really strong and so over time they have wandered away it's interesting hebrews talks about it doesn't it you know that we can just wander away we can kind of drift like a little being on a lie low on a lovely sea and you kind of fall asleep and the lie low just slowly drifts out and christians just drift away i think don carson is very helpful on this where he says that whenever anybody backslides he says it's through a thousand insignificant decisions a thousand insignificant decisions but what will happen with those people generally is they'll come to a point and then they'll come back. There's something even in their time wandering away where there's something in their conscience. There's an unease where they know just God's not letting them go. Now that can be for a week. It can be for a month. It can be for a year. I would say I've seen it in people for a decade. I've seen people come back to church who had made a, a confession of faith in their childhood, in their teens, and have gone away and all manner of things have happened, but they are truly the Lord's. And in the end, the Lord has brought them back. And I think that often you will see that. But I do think, and this is something that we can discuss, I do think as well we've got to leave open that some people are truly saved and they've wandered away and they might even die in that state but if they're saved they're truly saved as if one through the flames and I think that has impact now we've got to trust God in that we've got to trust God in that I think I want to be very weary of putting hard and fast rules down so what does that mean does that mean well that you know if someone wanders away just just leave it because well they're probably saved anyway and they'll go to heaven well no in that state there's no assurance and if there's no evidence of grace we can have no assurance for them and actually if you are happy just to wander away and go well who cares because you know when i die i'll go to heaven anyway i think that kind of heart shows there's no true born again nature the born again nature will mean that deep down deep down they'll know even in the most successful of lives or the most deep of sins deep down late at night when they search their hearts on their bed they'll know deep down there's something not right and so that means that whenever anybody's in that state of not holding on to the hope then they should they should be uneasy about that. They shouldn't have an assurance. And we should be uneasy about that. And we shouldn't have an assurance for them. But what we should do is say, come to the hope. So what's the message for those different groups of people? You ready? The gospel. It's the same message for all of them. All of them need to hear the gospel. Because if they're not saved, they need to hear the gospel. And they can be saved. And if they are saved but wandering away, they need to hear the gospel. So they'll come back to the Lord. I think when it comes to these things, we keep presenting the gospel. We keep praying for them. And so I don't want to take the sting out of the passage. I think we want to make sure that we're holding on to the hope that we have. Um, there's always different languages, isn't there? Some people use the, um, the phrase, you know, once saved, always saved. Um, and then that in a certain Christian world is put into I made a decision in the meeting and I signed a card um, and so if you sign that card you're always saved and that's really unhelpful um, other people then would prefer things like um, the perseverance of the saints I like that the saints will persevere I'm more of a fan of preservation of the saints that the saints will be preserved truly those who are the Lord's even though they go through windy paths, ultimately will be kept and ultimately will, will trust in him. And that's all because of the Lord Jesus. If you don't trust in the complete Lord Jesus, then you will go to all other things. Legalism, mysticism, um, asceticism, whatever that providentially vague Colossian heresy is. But if we trust in Jesus, 
we will be his.